I think I was a little bitter is how I got uh, invited back. But be that as it may, uh, I'm, I am Chet Richards, and this is yet another lecture on leadership. But I'm not going to walk you through some eight principles of enlightened leadership. And I'm not going to lay out a roadmap for you for how to create a leadership development program, although that's a worthy endeavor also. I'm going to reveal to you five ancient practices used down through history by great leaders to great effect, but which for some reason seem to have become obscured or even lost by mainstream management media. How can this be? I hear you ask, and I know where you're coming from. I ran a search for leadership on Amazon, and I got over 60,000 results. That just means Amazon stopped counting at 60,000, by the way. How would you like it if your book was on page 438? I mean, you know, what's the point of 60,000? But it does show you what, a, what an industry leadership is. And in fact, the leadership guru community keeps cranking this stuff out, and not just books magazines and journal articles, but they're flooding the new media. And you guys know what we're talking about here, you know, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, webcasts, pod podcasts, webinars. Still trying to figure out the difference between a webcast and a, a webinar, but um, YouTube channels. Everybody's got a YouTube channel now. And of course, everybody's favorite, the monster Zoom call. So you might think, you know, logically believe that since the dawn of human history, we've never had such opportunities to learn and teach leadership. So given all of that, the practice of leadership must be reaching heights that it hasn't seen since Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. To which I can only respond, oh really? <clears throat> now those of you that have read the notes know what's, kind of know what's coming here, but I'd like you to participate in, in the exercise anyway. I'm going to show you two headlines, fairly recent, and I blanked the names out just so we can concentrate on the words. So even though you might know who these people are, please just concentrate on the words for this first part of this exercise. KPIs, uh, I'm assuming means here key performance indicators, and what he wants to do is chop off the bottom 5 to 10 percent of his organization. Now everybody, for just a second, everybody be real, real quiet. Shh. Quiet. Listen. Close your eyes. Listen. I'm still not sure about that. Siri doesn't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Which is a case uh, depressingly about, Well, that's maybe beyond my case. I, I, I sympathize with you, dear. OK, let's go ahead and be real quiet. Listen. Everybody listen. That sound you hear is W. Edwards Deming rolling over in his grave. <laughs> right? 2022 marks the 40th anniversary of the publication of his seminal work, Out of the Crisis. I have no idea how old that makes me feel. In which he promulgated his 14 points for the transformation of management. Now, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the 14 points. At this point, I usually call somebody in the audience to recite them for me. But just in case you've forgotten, point 11b is eliminate management by objective. Eliminate management by numbers and numerical goals. Substitute leadership. It's exact quote, substitute leadership. Now this next person <coughs> seems to be having some problem with appreciating and understanding what his people are doing. As a side, if he had adopted Kanban, that might not be an issue for him. But be that as it may, what he can do is tabulate how many of them commuted into the office that day. So. The depressing thing about all this is this is two of the most successful entrepreneurs anywhere at any time, changing life in the 21st century. In the case of Elon Musk, maybe even beyond that. And not to pick on Mark Zuckerberg there, but it's depressingly common practice. Goldman Sachs, for example, is bringing back its performance reviews with the goal of chopping off the bottom 5 to 10 percent of their organization. Now, those of you that are into, into military history may remember that the Roman army had a punishment called decimation. I'm coming out here because I'm going to apply the punishment to one of these tables. And it was reserved for units that had shown cowardice in the face of the enemy, 
or had mutinied. And it went something like this. They took the unit and divided it up into groups of 10. They handed each group a set of straws. You drew straws. The person that drew the short straw was immediately clubbed or stabbed by the other members of his group. Now think about that. These are people that have lived together, trained together, fought together, bled together for years. A true band of brothers. And now you had to kill one of them. Well, history also records that the punishment was rarely ever used. In fact, the greatest Roman general of them all, Julius Caesar, never used it, which should tell you something. Goldman Sachs wants to do it to itself every year. Now, Goldman Sachs is also part of the foursome back to the office movement. And in that, they have a lot of company. But in Goldman's case, what they want is to Im improve collaboration, a worthy goal. But think about it. There is no better way to kill collaboration or camaraderie or esprit de corps or comradeship or any of that than set your own people in mortal competition with each other. Because if you do something good for somebody else, you may have just put yourself over the 10% line. So in fact, the article where I got this from basically quotes from management gurus about why it's such a bad idea. But they're not the first ones to do it. Of course, General Electric had a, had a similar scheme under Jack Welch. Y'all remember Jack Welch? Y'all remember General Electric? It was dropped from the, uh, from the Dow Jones Industrials back in 2018. Um, so, you know, you kind of you wonder where we're going with all of this. And it seems to be in a, definitely in a top-down direction. Howard Schultz at Starbucks, Tim Cook at, at Apple, um, I see Apple is beginning to have now some organized protests against this. Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase. And I'm not going to comment on whether or not it's a good idea to have everybody back in the office or not, although I think that's a decision that should be left to the teams. That's just my personal preference. But the way that it's being implemented is essentially top-down micromanagement, the very antithesis of leadership. Reminds me of David's quote from yesterday where he said, everywhere I go in the world, leadership is in short supply, despite the 60,000 books. So it makes you wonder, maybe leadership's not that important. Maybe we've been barking up the wrong tree all these years. I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. I think leadership is as important now as it, it, ever, as it ever was. And I'm going to offer an alternative explanation for Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk a little later on when I get to my chart on leadership. So something is obviously missing, 60,000 books, YouTube channels, etc., in the way that we are preparing uh, leaders and teaching leadership. And the question is, what could that be? And my answer is, do you believe in magic? Ah, I'm detecting doubt, dissent, and disbelief. I shall dispel that right in front of you by performing some magic of my own. Shazam. Now, Unfortunately, if we can turn the lights down here, I'll try this, otherwise I have another one. You, to, for this illusion to work, you've got to be pretty well lined up with the center of the, uh, of, of the screen. And so if you want to kind of move where you can see it, otherwise I have another illusion coming up next. But this is created by a professor in Tokyo who studies um, optical illusions for a living. And if it's working, you'll see the wheels move. And when you look at a wheel, it will stop. And when you shift your gaze to another wheel, the first wheel will start up and the, and, the, and the one that you're looking at will stop. Now, if you can't see it, I give you the reference to this in your, uh, in, in your handouts. And you do have to be pretty well lined up because it depends on some wiring of the brain, the difference between straight on vision and peripheral vision. Does anybody have any luck seeing? Uh, it works so well on the screen. I say, if it doesn't work for you, uh, when you get your notes, go ahead and log into that site and you can see it. Here's another one. This is one of the uh, most famous optical illusions of them all. It's called the Cafe Wall Illusion. It dates back to 1898. All of the lines in there are parallel. All the horizontal lines are parallel. And they're all straight. There's no bows and, and there's no angles. I like this illusion. Very, very easy. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, you can see it from any angle. Nobody is exactly sure, by the way, why this illusion works. Pretty easy in the other one to figure it out. Spectacular illusion. But, uh, but this one has been around for 125 years now, and it still works, and nobody has really, really figured it out. But we know 
at least in theory, what's going on with all of these. And it's what you see here. So what he's talking about is this. The brain doesn't see anything. The brain sits isolated in the skull, alone, and in the dark. 85 billion neurons talking to each other over perhaps as many as a quintillion, it's quad, uh, quintillion, 10 to the 15th connections called synapses. They don't actually touch at the synapses, but that's how, that's how neurons talk to each other. And the neurons are talking all of the time. They fire at the rate of between 5 and 50 times a second. And so you got 86 billion neurons talking to each other constantly over 10 to the 15th connections. So what you have is a this massively parallel wetware, I guess you'd call it, running an incredibly, incredibly complex system. Now, as we all know, complex systems uh, have emergent properties. They exhibit emergent properties when, 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 when seen from a macro perspective. One of the emergent properties that this system that we talked about generates is a mental model of what's going on in the universe. And it doesn't reside in any particular part of the brain. Uh, various different parts of the brain carry out uh, different functions. For example, the mental models are influenced in near real time by sensory inputs. If you're sighted, it would be uh, inputs across the optic nerve. If you, if you can hear, then it's the cochlear nerve, and so on. And the various sensory nerves for the skin and uh, proprioceptive senses so we can feel where our joints are and things like that. In near real time, there's about a tenth to a half a second delay between the time that the signal reaches our brain and the time that our mental model registers that as a, ch a change in our environment. So we don't actually see anything. What we actually do is we experience this mental model as perception, perhaps even consciousness. You start getting into, in, into philosophy here, and there's still an awful lot of work yet to be done. But when you interfere with the workings of this mental model, you see that as a change in perception. And particularly, even though it's very accurate, if you've ever watched anybody do gymnastics on the beam, and I had two daughters, my heart has not recovered from that yet, you know how accurate it can be. I mean, like doing a backflip onto a four inch wide beam, you know, three feet off the ground. So it's a very accurate mental model most of the time. But the map is not the terrain, and the model is not reality, and it can be fooled, as we have, as we have seen. So your perception is an illusion. It's you experiencing this mental model. The perception of everybody in your organization are illusions. You, what you think your organization is doing is an illusion. It may be very accurate. It may not be a delusion most of the time, but it's still an illusion. It's still your mental model that, that you're experiencing. So that being the case, it might help to learn something about illusions and how they work. Now, I'm not saying whether or not the universe itself is an illusion. That's, that's a, different, a different subject entirely. And that wouldn't make any difference. Suppose you woke up tomorrow morning and you found the the world, the reality was actually an illusion. What would you do differently? But if you understand how illusions of the mind work and you're around other people, then there might be some things that you can use there as leaders to help you become more effective leaders. So it also presents opportunities, as, we're gonna, as I'm going to try to point out here, to expand your leadership in ways that you may not have thought about before, although every one of you is familiar with every one of these techniques, uh, but perhaps not as tools of leadership. So let me explain magic you can actually use. Stage magic, number one. So we're talking about somebody up on stage like this, doing card tricks, pulling rabbits out of the hat, sawing people in half. Stage magic. Now here's the interesting thing about stage magic. You know it's a lie. They're not really sawing people in half up there. I, I hope I didn't, I didn't destroy anybody's illusions there. They're not really doing that. They are really pulling a rabbit out of the hat, but that's a different, a different thing. So the trick is here, you know you're being lied to, but if it's a good show, you still stand up at the end of it and applaud and say, how did they do that? Even though you knew from the beginning they were lying to you. See, that's the essence of magic. Now think about it. Many of you all here, to extent I think all of you all, consider yourself change agents. And you know, and there was a really good talk yesterday afternoon by, from Annette on how hard it can be to actually change things. Factors that uh, uh, she mentioned, like politics both in the organization and nationally, which you have no great control over, but they can affect how you, how you do things. So how do you, 
how do you overcome resistance to change? Because the key here is you know it's a lie, so you tell yourself, I'm going to figure it out. You resist being lied to by the magician, but it works anyway. People on your team know that you're going to try to convince them. They may or may not want to go along with it. There's just naturally people resist new stuff being shoved down their throats, and was, or let's say being proposed to them to various degrees. So maybe we can learn something from the, how magicians overcome actually telling a lie to help you overcome resistance to change in your own organization. And with that in mind, uh, Nathan, if you could cue it. And turn the sound up. Oh, Georgia Manassas, I assume, is a member of, her, of their troop. She's a contortionist, as you could tell. OK, how was it done? What was the secret? Now, ordinarily, I don't like to give away magic secrets because it ruins it for everybody else. But we need to understand how it was actually done so we can see the misdirection. And also, Penn Gillette, the tall guy there, on his YouTube channel every now and then explains the magic trick. So how was it done? Anybody, what was the, what was the key to this trick? It's always there. That's right. It was always there. It had to be. There was no, there's no other explanation. If you watch it very carefully, if when you get back, you run, this, you run this video, and you can search YouTube for pin, teller, and misdirection and find it very quickly. And watch very carefully. You'll see that that cage is a lot longer, that coop is a lot longer than it needs to be just to hold the chicken. And you'll notice a few other things, like pin, Gillette is standing like this. That's so he can brace the thing while Georgie Manassas is moving around inside there. But what was the misdirection? What things did they do to ensure that you would not come to that to that conclusion. See, that's the misdirection here. If you studied it long enough and you thought about it long enough, you'd pick it up, you'd solve it. You're watching everything except the cage. That's the very important part of it, which is to keep you from looking at that cage at least long enough to figure it out. So one thing is just the tempo. Things are happening very quickly here. Anybody else got, have any ideas of what other misdirection they use in this? Well, I'll throw one out for you. Um, Penn keeps, uh, Gillette, Penn keeps doing this. Now, the guy's rich as Midas. You know, he can afford to have his glasses adjusted. You buy your glasses at Sam Club, they'll adjust them for you every time you go in for free. So he, he, he does, but he keeps, because that, for just a second there, that pulls your attention away. How about when he, you know, when he does this, hey, look over there, you know, your, your hand follows him up. Things, uh, and there are some others that we'll talk about as we go along. If you think about that, that routine, everything that he and Teller do, 
is to keep you from figuring out how the trick worked. In a sense, by the way, that's, that's a very, very sophisticated use of, of Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, remember, talked about all warfare is based upon deception. This really isn't deception. Deception is when they try to get you to believe that B is true when it's actually A. Here, what they're trying to do is just keep you confused. And then at the end, they spring something really, really cool. So it's really a, 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 a very sophisticated use of this direction. So let's go back. One last, one last shot at neurophysiology. The brain's predicting what's going to happen, or in this case, it's confused and it can't make a good prediction. But the important thing is that mental model that you have inside your head can be used for prediction. In fact, that, if you consider the mental model as being roughly the same thing as orientation, that was John Boyd's primary, primary use of it. This massively, massively parallel computer you have is basically running a, well, what if A, what's the implications, what if B, what's the implications, what if C, what's the implications. It's extremely fast. It's so fast, a lot of people think there must be some kind of quantum processing going on inside there, but very controversial subject. But at some point then, it decides, ah, I like the, I like the outcome over here best, and you perceive it as a, aha, that's what it is, that's what I'm going to do. And the brain then latches onto that story. And once it finds a story it likes, then there's more neuro, uh, neurophysiology comes in. Uh, it, kind of, it kind of decides that it's going to defend that story. I mean, once it's come out and said, this is what it is, it, it doesn't like to be contradicted. So evidence that supports the story generates serotonin, neurotransmitter that helps feeling pleasure. And evidence that contradicts the story generates, uh, well, it fires up the amygdala body, among other things, which is your fear and loathing, among, among uh, the brain is extremely complicated. Every part of the brain does a whole bunch of different things. But the amygdala body is deep in the base of the brain, and it's heavily implicated in things like fear, and, uh, and that actually, uh, and, and feeling uncomfortable. So when you see things that contradict the story the brain is telling itself, uh, you actually will look for ways to, to uh, play that down. You may have seen some articles recently on how facts, uh, giving people facts is not a good way to convince them that they're wrong. In fact, if anything else, in, to defending themselves against your facts can actually lock them in uh, more tightly. Much better to appeal to emotion or other things than to, than to try to confuse them with facts. Those of you who remember a little elementary statistics may remember that there's a theorem that talks about what's the probability of A given, given B. Bayes theorem, and so the brain has been called a Bayesian prediction machine. And that's kind of what we're, what we're saying here. The trick is get the, get the people okay, to tell themselves a story, and then you, you give them things that reinforces that, that story, and you can truly, truly lock them in tight. We're going to see that again. We're going to see several instances of that. Now, let's carry that one step farther. Stage magic's evil twin, mentalism. You may not be familiar with the name, but we're talking about things like mind reading, or the illusion of mind reading and mind control. No, not brain reading, mind reading. The, probably the best known mentalist currently practicing is the Englishman Darren Brown. He had a show on Broadway back in 2019, and he's got, I think it is, three, three movies out on, on Netflix now, as well as, of course, the ubiquitous YouTube channel. I recommend very strongly, as soon as you get out of here, subscribe to his YouTube channel and listen to his TED Talk. It really explains a lot about how, how this illusion thing works and, and really how far you can manipulate it if you use the right techniques, as he explains here. This is a good article, by the way. It's behind a paywall, so I couldn't, I couldn't give it to you. But you can, you can probably dig it out. But you notice magic. So he's talking about curating of attention, that sort of thing. Misdirection, we've seen that. We'll talk about more about psychology in the, um, a little bit here. Uh, not to mention the power of the well-placed lie. Now think about what we just saw with Penn and Teller. Right at the end, remember where Teller says, and then did any of you see us sneak the gorilla back into the cage? And he rips it off. That was a lie. They didn't sneak the gorilla into the cage. The gorilla has been there all along. So that's what Darren Brown is talking about, uh, about here. Every now and then, you've got to kind of sneak that in to keep, the, uh, to keep the show going. Now, specifically, some things that you can use for mentalism. One of the things Brown does is when he calls somebody from the audience up on the stage, he goes to shake their hand, and he pulls his hand away. It causes a moment of confusion, which, as you'll see from some of his videos, he can then exploit to do other things with. Cold reading is a very, very useful 
palette. You may find it useful on your own. Requires a lot of work and practice, though. Essentially, what you do with cold reading is you have a series of guesses, and you you spring these on your on your on, on your subject. You ask them some questions. You say, "Well, what about? Tell me about. Did you ever that kind of thing?" And then, based on that and on their body language, on on what their eye movements, you. Uh, you ask them another question, a little bit further down, a little bit further down, until right at the end you can say, ah, so you met your, uh, you met your husband at uh, Claremont College in, in, in 1972. And you, How did you know that? Well, you told me. You didn't realize you told me, but that's the, that's the mentalist art. That's cold reading. You don't know anything about them, but through a series of very careful questions and your ability to interpret the answer, you can infer. You can infer a lot of stuff that uh, that, in fact, sometimes that they really wish they hadn't told you. Now, the opposite of that, or the complement to that, is anchoring. Anchoring, extremely important skill, and one that you all really do need to master, because I think as change agents, you're going to find it very, very useful. In anchoring, you don't try to read the other person's mind. It's more like you try to write it. Makes sense that it's easier to read somebody's mind if you wrote what's in it in the first place. So what you do in anchoring is you plant suggestions as you go along. For example, and you'll see this in one of Darren Brown's things, at the end of it, he'll have the person circle a, a word in a newspaper article or something and hold it up to the camera. Then he reaches into his, his, his pocket, he pulls out an envelope, rips the top of the envelope up, pulls out a sheet of paper, and there's that same word. And everybody goes, incredible. And he says, no, it's not incredible. It was inevitable. I planted that word in her mind and then did a bunch of things to make sure that I didn't give her enough time to really do anything else. When she looked down, she saw that word, that's the word she picked, anchoring. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, specifically how you can use anchoring later. Now, confirmation bias, incestuous amplification, and inattentional blindness is a phenomenon of the human brain that you can use to bolster these other tools. Remember I said once the brain starts telling itself a story, it looks for things to confirm that story and tends to reject things that that don't. So, for example, using Boyd's infamous OODA loop, when you're curating attention, what you're doing is you're working the observation phase. You're controlling their observation, what they see and the order they see it in and the timing between observations in order to affect their orientation. That, in this case, the story that the brain is, is telling itself. And once the brain starts to buy into the story, then over the implicit guidance and control loop feed here, then it steers observation again towards things it likes, serotonin goes up, and things and away from things it doesn't like, the amygdala body fires up and, and makes you quite uncomfortable. And that goes around and around and around, and it can become extremely, extremely strong. Now the difference, big difference between mentalism and stage magic is mentalism is everywhere. You've probably used it already today or had it used on you already today. Stage magic is some guy's got to get up on stage and do a magic trick for you. Or at a party, you know, whip out a deck of cards and do a magic trick. Mentalism, however, is everywhere you look. Let me give you some examples. Human source intelligence, human, and interrogation. Okay, you've got a source in a foreign country's Ministry of Defense, one that's not particularly friendly to us at the moment. And you want that source, for example, to tell us something about the preparations they might be making for, say, launching an operation. Now, the source knows that he really shouldn't tell you that. And if he finds out that he has talk, it's probably going to be very uncomfortable for him. So basically, you want the source to betray his country. So how do you do it? The answer everybody gives, and every one of you is thinking right now, is you torture him. Obvious, right? Well, torture is an excellent device. It works about 90 to 95 percent of the time in obtaining confessions. Whether the person did it or not is immaterial. You will get a confession because they will tell you whatever they think it takes to get you to stop torturing them. Because torture hurts. That's the whole idea behind it. So if you really want to find out what, what the real situation is, what you want the person to do is voluntarily to want to give you the information that you want. And that's where the techniques of mentalism come in very, very handy. And if you've ever had any training in this, and you think back over the training that you had, I think you'll recognize cold reading and anchoring and forms of hypno hypnosis and suggestion and things like that. A friend of mine who was in this business said, if you do this stuff right away, the big problem is getting the subject to shut up. <laughs>
<laughs> We've talked about uh, fortune telling and psychic sessions, cold reading. Fortune tellers and psychics, that's about the only tool they really have. They might do a little anchoring, but they're not trying to get you to say things. They're trying to guess the things that, uh, that um, you really don't want to tell them, that you don't think that you've told them. They may do a little anchoring, but basically it's all cold reading. And by the way, if you're ever in New Orleans, and go down to Jackson Square, there's always some fortune tellers along in there, and they've been there for years, and some of them are really, really good. Uh, you may pay 40, 50 bucks. My wife one time said, I just want to do this. So she paid her 40 bucks, she was in there like an hour, and she said, God, I learned so much, this person's even better than a psychiatrist. And I said, well, she got an hour's worth of entertainment for $50, and it is cheaper than a psychiatrist, by the way. <laughs> this guy is Aleister Crowley. I don't know if very many of you have heard of him. Short story by Hemingway called him the most evil man alive. Um, he was a mountaineer. He was an author. Um, he was a mentalist of high note. Um, he was a famous hedonist. And among other things, he started a cult, a religion. And I, I just hope there's nobody a member of it in the room here today, but it's unlikely because there's only about 1,500 members. But it still survives. He died in 1947. His religion called Philema still survives today. And, uh, but the techniques that he used in there are classic mentalism, but when they use it for the service of a cult, we call it brainwashing. But it's the same, it's the same thing. And as we know, it can get extremely, extremely strong. Think of Jonestown, drink the Kool-Aid. Well, here in San Diego, Heaven's Gate. You know, once these things get going, and once you get incestuous amplification going, uh, it can be enormously, it can be basically impossible to break. Remember, uh, what they call it, deprogramming. It doesn't always work. So these are the extremely, extremely powerful techniques we're talking about here. I wanted to use seduction, but my wife said, nah, that word's too loaded. Why don't you just use romance? But we all know what we're talking about here. Subject of many, many a good novel, not to mention a, a good movie. Now think of what goes on inside your company, inside your organization. And think about what we've been talking about here. Go watch a couple of those Darren Brown videos um, um, on how mentalism works, and then come back and look at this list, and then think about what's going on inside your company. And it may be fairly benign. For example, many times, depending on the situation, it doesn't, it's not a good idea to hit somebody up for a decision right away. You want to do a little anchoring. You want to plant some seeds. We've all done it. So that's the kind of things we're talking about here. And if you understand that, and you understand incestuous amplification and curation of a story and all of that, you can, with any luck, lead them right into the decision that you want them to make. Now, point. If you're the person that's on the receiving end of this, you need to recognize it. You need to be able to understand what's going on here and make a, a rational decision, not be guided by a successful mentalism operation. One of the keys of Eastern military philosophy, Eastern conflict, and those of you that are in my uh, workshop tomorrow are going to get this ad, fin ad infinitum, but it's mental control of the opponent. Sun Tzu said all warfare is based upon deception. It's a form of mentalism. And here's a good one from Miyamoto Musashi, Book of Five Rings, mid 17th, 17th century. Notice what he says here. Now, wouldn't that be good? You know, you could just command the enemy troops to leave. That might be a little much, but how about if you could wave your wand and change the enemy, uh, the enemy army into a scene of mass confusion, chaos, conflict, people going every which direction, fighting among each other? Wouldn't that be great? You might not even have to fight at all. You might win before fighting. You might even be certain to win, to coin a phrase. Well, John Boyd, among, among many others, said, hey, this doesn't have to be anything mysterious. It is actually possible to do this. This is from his chart, Patterns of Conflict. But the way you do it is not by waving a wand. You do it by these things over here called operating inside the OODA loop, fast transients. Transient is just a change, being able to do this more effectively than the, other, than the other side. In other words, operate inside the enemy's OODA loop. And after 132 pages, he concludes that if you can do that, you can do all of these great things, ending up with this magical result. So if you're thinking in terms of the magical result, there may be things that you can do, almost like engineering, to bring them, to bring them about. How about magic and production control? I'm assuming in here everybody knows who Tai Chi Ono is. We wouldn't be here without Tai Chi Ono. Um, and notice what he says here. This is from his book, Toyota Production System. Not by arithmetic, in other words, management, not by numbers, not by numerical goals, but by ninjutsu. Um, 
as I understand it, those of you that know the Toyota, persistence, Toyota production system probably know this better than me, but there's, a, there's an artifact of it called the Ono Circle. You draw a circle somewhere in the factory and you stand at it. And the reason is, if you're the boss, if you have the power to fire people, promote people, or otherwise uh, affect their life, when you show up on the scene, people notice. It affects what's going on. You know, you're not invisible. To be invisible as a boss is a, is a really, really hard thing to do. I mean, you can try spying on them, counting their keystrokes, seeing if they've turned on their Zoom cameras. That gets detected. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, in fact, we're talking about something even deeper than the Ono Circle. Let me go back just a little bit here. Well, I'll talk about it from here. Um, Taichi Ono, as an educated Japanese, was certainly familiar with the Tao Te Ching. And in chapter 17 of the Tao Te Ching, it says, the master doesn't talk, they act. And when their work is done, the people say, amazing, we did it all by ourselves. Nunjutsu, you were invisible, but you made it happen anyway. Even the rock hard Marine Corps is into this stuff, mind, mind reading. This book, by the way, I think I give you the... Uh, the URL from it, or you can just, you can just Google it, you, you'll find it. It's available off the Marine Corps site. Your taxpayer dollars at work. If you're not an American citizen, you're welcome. <laughs> very, very good book, by the way. It's the kind of the, lays out what we call uh, a maneuver warfare. Again, tracing its roots back to Sun Tzu. How about this? How many of y'all have had formal sales training? It was where they actually walked you through closing process, how you actually close a sale. I have, yeah, a few of us here. It's a fascinating art. How do you actually make a, make a close? And if you remember what your, what your steps were that you went through and map them back onto what, the techniques of mentalism, you can see there's cold reading because you typically start out by asking a lot of questions, trying to understand the other person's problem. And then through anchoring, you try to plant the seeds in it that your, your organization's offering, product or service, is a solution. You try to get them to tell themselves a story, the story eventually indicating with how buying your product or service is going to solve all their problems and, and make them look like heroes in their company and make them look great and all of that. So all these techniques are wrapped into typical closing, but they're just, they're basically mentalism 101. So if you understand the principles of mentalism, you can take your sales and closing technique a little bit and sort of ramp them up some. By the way, who's this guy? Those of you from Plano, Texas should know him. Oh, God, you make me feel so old. Who? Ross Perot. Yeah, H. Ross Perot. And he was an incredible salesman. Even though he wasn't your typical six-foot tall, booming voice, you know, we kind of think of um, uh, a madman kind of salesperson. Okay, gambling. Why is gambling a magical art? It's a bunch of people sitting there playing cards. So what's, what's so magical about that? Well, what's magical about it is this classic observation. And once you start playing the other players, you're into mentalism, maybe even magic. Yeah, you need to know the mechanics. You, gotta ha you, you have to have the rules of the game down pat. You have to be able, you have to know, you have to know the math, you got to know the probabilities. But see, everybody knows that. You can't do what this guy did, become six-time World Series champion of poker, just by doing these things here, because everybody is good at those. Suppose there's a thousand people at your World Championship of Poker. They're all good. That's how they got there. Your odds of winning that World Championship then, if you're just as good as they are, is one in a thousand, one over ten to the third. So what are your odds of winning six of them? But over 10 to the 18th, pretty good size number, quintillion as I, I think I worked it out to be a big number. Really, I don't know, actually, really small number, it's one over. So you can't do it just by, there's got to be something else going on. Now in his master class, he does talk a little bit about these things. And this is, this is kind of into um, cold reading. I don't know, there's nothing in there saying that he's going to talk about anchoring. But if you go to that YouTube video by a guy named Andy Kucharski, and I give you the give you the URL. Uh, in that one, which is called Taking the Luck Out of Gambling, he does talk about techniques that we would call anchoring uh, and some other techniques of, of, um, of mentalism that you can use in gambling. Now we're talking aga about gambling against real thinking human beings. Blackjack doesn't work and pulling the handle on the slot machine. Mentalism is totally lost on the slot machine, by the way. I'll, 
I'll, I'll give you that suggestion if you're planning to go to Vegas. What about storytelling? I said these, these, these things were obscured or lost forever. Certainly storytelling is not lost forever. As you can see, there's like 60,000 results again. However, if all you're going to do is tell stories, if that's, if that's the extent of it, I'd say you'd be better served to get out the guitar and sing Kumbaya. The big boss stands up in a conference, tells a heartwarming story about how they saved the company by some daring feat of sales ledger domain. And then everybody goes back to their cube farm to the same old top-down micromanagement. You know, the story just vanishes into the ether and is, is gone. However, remember, Penn talked about we're going to give you a story you can tell yourself, and then he seeded that story with the story he wanted you to tell yourself. You know, at no time you're going to let your attention, and he's right there by the thing. What he really wants you to do is keep your attention focused right, you know, right here or somewhere, not looking at the depth of the, of the, um, of the chicken coop. So if, it's, if, if you know how to use it, think of it as a technique and not a tactic or a strategy. It can be extremely, extremely, extremely important. However, well, let me give you an example first. Here's a story that you can get people telling themselves in your organization how great it's going to be once we move down the Kanban maturity model. And once you get them saying, hey, this is what we really want to do, this is what we're, what we're going to make happen, then, you see, it kind of it aids the whole, the whole process. So in addition to everything you're doing here, think in terms of, well, curation of attention, giving them a story they can tell themselves, and then reinforce their telling of that story using some of the techniques we've talked about. Incidentally, I love this, anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is very closely related to the concept of operating inside the OODA loop. And since operating inside the OODA loop is essentially a magical art, I suggest magic flows all through this or the potential for magic anyway. Now, if storytelling is so great, who actually studies how to tell stories? Show of hands. Those of you that had formal management training, MBAs or something like that, yeah, how many of you had to tell a convincing story in order to graduate? Yeah, right. You had to, do, you had to typically pass uh, what, accounting and statistics and organizational design and human behavior and all that kind of stuff. But if storytelling is so important, why don't we require classes in that and demonstrate a competency in that in order to graduate? Well, there are ways, places you can go to learn it. This is a good book, by the way. I like this one a lot. The chapter on comedy is one sentence. You can say anything as long as it's funny. Pretty, pretty good. Oops. This is from the course catalog at University of California, San Diego. And you notice, as many of them do, they put writing fiction and writing poetry side by side. Now, writing poetry, poetry is, the, for our purpose, it's the sound and the feel of the words as contrasted to the meaning of the words. And when you put them both together, you get poetry. Or you can go online. This is from edX. It's a pretty, pretty good institution at edX, Berkeley, University of Cambridge. So there's lots of interesting stuff going on here. If you, uh, if you want to do it. Now think about this. What can you, why writing fiction? Why reading fiction? A fiction writer has got to lead you through 300, 400, 500 pages and keep your interest all the way to the end. You have a 20 page report to do. A lot of us can't even keep interest for that long. So if you learn kind of how fiction writers can keep and build your interest all the way through and hold you to the end, you might pick up something useful. And then if you understand something about poetry, you can make the language more attractive too, much very much like Steve Jobs with calligraphy. You give it that little extra bit, a little bit of magic into your writing, not suggesting that you drop a poem in the middle of your next report, but just becoming cognizant of the feel and the sound of the language uh, can be a very important part of convincing people um, to at least finish your paper, at least make it possible to do that. And all, that, all writing is, is really fiction, you know, in a, in a way. Those of you who read the notes know who this guy is. He was a published poet, by the way, in his 20s. A little, a little newer, yeah, a little newer picture of him. I give the references in the notes. Interesting, interesting guy. Okay, now, time to be honest with each other. We have all had times in our careers when the ability to suddenly shift your shape over into that of a werewolf would have been extremely useful and ripped somebody's heart right out. 
Come on, well, you know, admit it. There were times that you wish you could have done just that. I don't know how to do that. But I can give you some advice on another form of shape shifting. And those of you, by the way, that have seen the articles about what the actors that don't look like their characters, I think my favorite is Rachel Brosnahan, doesn't look at all like Midge Maisel, if you're into the marvelous Ms. Maisel. They can truly do changes in their personality and behavior and with a little help with the, with the makeup that they might as well be. They might as well be shape-shifting. Now, every time I bring up acting, somebody whines, I want to be authentic. Well, I got news for you, Bucky. Nobody cares about your authentic persona. They care about your leadership skills. And if those get hidden behind things like this, and we all do it, or this, it's going to put a big dent in your ability to exercise leadership. And unless you've been trained not to do these things, you're probably not even aware that you're doing them. And well, that's what acting training can help you to do. They can help you get across the message that you're trying to get across. Now, to deepen the relationship between leadership and acting, here, here's my definition of leadership. Two parts. The only thing that's really important from a leadership standpoint is that if you try to do this top down, you kill this. Deader than a doorknob. No better way to kill initiative than a micromanaging. So instead of using a top-down push system to make this kind of a thing work, you have to use a, a bottom-up pull system. In other words, leadership is all about persuasion, real leadership. If you're just going to give somebody an order, you don't need any leadership for that. You can easily write a little program to do that, a little AI routine, issue orders. This is Aristotle tutoring Prince Alexander of Macedon. Yes, that Alexander in the mid-fourth century. So what was he teaching him? Well, we can be pretty sure he wasn't teaching him military strategy. Alexander was 16, 17, 18 years old when this, was, when this was done. He was already a seasoned warrior, and he and his father were already inventing the, the basis of what we now call maneuver warfare. It wasn't that Marine Corps manual. So he knew a lot more about military strategy than Aristotle ever would. But what Aristotle did know, what Aristotle was teaching, was things like this. Now, back in the good old day, when, when you went off to university, at the uh, underclassman level, you studied the trivium. The trivium was rhetoric, grammar, and logic. And once you had those three down, then they moved you to the quadrium, which uh, included such things as natural philosophy, arithmetic, geometry, STEM subjects, as we, would, as we would call them now. But everybody started out learning rhetoric. as defined by Aristotle as meaning all the available means of persuasion. Well, if you're going to exercise that kind of leadership that I talked about, and if knowing how to persuade people is important, then maybe, you know, this is a subject you might want to invest a little in. Logic, emotion, and the character of the person saying it. For example, just to pick one out of thin air, form, empathy, move people emotionally. Pathos. Very, very important. Because where the heart leads, the mind will follow. It's true. They spent a lot of time back in ancient Greece, not having all of the things that we have, of course, spent a lot of time thinking about persuasion. How do you persuade people? And they came up with a bunch of things called rhetorical devices. And these are some of them used in Pericles' funeral oration about 75 years before the picture that you just saw. I'm not going to walk you through all of these. There's a reference down there. You're welcome to play with them. But every one of these are things that you might be able to incorporate the next time that you talk or write. I'll give you some examples. Anastrophe is starting out with a negative. Ask not what your country can do for you. And that gets people's attention. But why not say, you know, don't ask or let's talk about what you can do for your country. It's ask not what your country can do for you. I come not to praise Caesar, but to bury him. Starting off with a negative. Procatalepsis is where you use strange language, you, you make a deliberate grammatical mistake, or even pretend to lose your train of thought right in the middle. Like when uh, Penn says, this is not some jive-ass story, or did you see Teller cop the chicken and split? We know what he's talking about, but those are words that are not used a whole lot anymore. Um, anaphora is another good one. You start, you use the same little phrase to start successive sentences. So when Penn said, you know, this is the vanishing chicken act, I told you that. You know we're pen and teller. You know we do magic tricks. Or how about, uh, how about this example? But in a larger sense, if you're not an American, this may not, this may not mean much to you, but, if, but in a larger sense, 
We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln, by the way, was a master of rhetoric. And not just in the, uh, in the, in, in the words. They always accompanied these with gestures. The Romans had a, a hand gesture they would use for him. They would slap the side of their toga. Lincoln, very tall guy, 6'4", our tallest president, liked to reach down and then reach way up when he was making a point. It would kind of overshadow his, uh, you know, his debating partner. And if you're interested in this sort of thing, by the way, MIT Open Courseware has got a little uh, one-hour thing called How to Speak by the late Professor uh, Patrick Henry Winston. Well worth checking out and listening to. You'll get some really, really, really good advice for your presentation from watching that little one-hour one hour thing. It's MIT Open Courseware, and it's on YouTube. And just look How, how to Speak uh, into YouTube. You'll find it. I was going to say, to be an effective leader, you have to be a good actor, but We'll leave it at this. You get the idea. Patton practiced his famous scowl in front of a mirror because it, it just it, he was he was quite an introverted introverted person. But he knew that in order to lead large numbers of people with the war going on, he had to act the part. If you if you go back and watch his speech at the beginning of the movie, Patton, he walks out in front of the big fight. That's based on some actual speeches he gave. You can see all kind of rhetorical devices in that speech. How about this guy? He had his personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffman, who, by the way, is best known uh, 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 otherwise for introducing him to Ava Brown. But uh, he had Heinrich Hoffman photograph him doing his famous, famous gestures. So if you check out Triumph of the Will, where Hitler is really going at it, that wasn't spontaneous. All that stuff was, was rehearsed and critiqued and honed out before he got up in public and tried to, and tried to do it. Unfortunately, quite effective. Now, I can, again, I can, I can hear you saying, all right, all right, this stuff is all good, but it's not real magic. I came here, I want to know about real magic. Can I use real magic? You mean stuff like this? <laughs> People have believed about, uh, in this stuff a lot longer than they believed in science. Yeah, we have, um, we have references to magic in cuneiform going back to 5000 B.C., Language is Sumerian, we can't even speak it anymore, but because of some Rosetta Stone-like stuff in cuneiform, we can decipher some of it. And cave art from maybe 40,000 BC appears to be magical in, uh, in these things. So these things go back an awful long way, and they're all attested to in the Bible. Every one of them. For example, this young lady is the witch of Endor, 1 Samuel 28. The, king, uh, the uh, king Saul, who was the commander of the Israeli army, getting ready to go in the battle the next day, wanted to consult with one of his colleagues. Inconveniently, that colleague was dead. It's the prophet Samuel. And so he engaged the witch of Endor to bring him back. And the Bible records that she did. And you can read the rest of it uh, in, in, in 1 Samuel 28. Now, every one of these is mentioned in the Bible, and every one of them is strictly forbidden in the Bible but not because they didn't work. So the question is, can you emulate the Witch of Endor and incorporate these diabolical arts into your leadership practice? Because I know that's what you're thinking right now. How can I use witchcraft to get people to finally buy into Kanban, for crying out loud? <laughs> Spell might come in handy. And don't forget, there's always the shapeshift into a werewolf and rip out their hearts. Well. Here is the one condition that you must meet if you're going to apply true diabolical witchcraft to your leadership practice. And I call it, this, I, I made this term up, Glendower's Dilemma, named on the character Owen Glendower from Shakespeare, Henry IV, Act Three, Scene One, if I recall. And in this, Owen Glendower and Henry Hotspur Percy are engaged in a rebellion against Henry IV, and they're off in Wales, and, they're, and they're, they're having a little meeting to get together and plan what they're going to do. And Glendower is portrayed as this blowhard buffoon. He's saying, you know, when I was born, the earth shook, and, uh, you know, a storm bo born, if you're into Game of Thrones, and I can do all of these things, and I can summon all of these things. And finally, he comes out and says, and I can call spirits from vasty deep. And Hotspur, who has had quite enough at this point, says, why, so can I, so can any man, but will they come when you do call for them? In other words, Hotspur was not saying they're not there. He just said, can you control, direct, or manipulate them? Can you do anything useful with them? I mean, think of it like this. Suppose you summoned a demon, 
a real demon from the depths of hell, and it appears, and it turns around and eats the cat. I would never hear the end of it. I can tell right now, I told you not to go summoning demons, now look what you've done. Yeah, you're, you're with me, you know what I'm talking about. So the answer, to, the answer to all of these is that you can use these diabolical arts if you can use them. If you can figure out a way to reliably cast spells, go for it. But just, if you wouldn't mind, stay away from me. I would really appreciate it. Fact has been well known for a long time. Clark, Arthur C. Clark, Clark's third law here, wasn't uh, the first to, to say it, but I think he said it very, very well. To which I have had a, um, my own version of it. Finger spits and get fooled if you're into, into the, uh, the maneuver warfare climate. By the way, um, Stephen Bungay mentions Finger Spits and Get Fooled in Art of Action. It's an excellent book if you're, if you're into it. Elon Musk, I love picking on Elon Musk. Elon Musk said engineering is magic made real. It works the other way too. Magic is engineering made real. Because to really do real magic, you put a lot of work and a lot of fun. You basically have to engineer, en engineer the trick. To which I will rephrase that as leadership. True leadership, when you really see it done well, is magical. And like David said, you travel all over the world and not see very much of it. So let me end here, wrap this up with some practical advice. You really need, these are techniques for manipulating the way the brain works. So you need to understand a little bit about how it actually, how these things actually work. And I've given you some references. But I think more than that, you need to develop a little bit of fluency, of competency in, it, in at least these two if nothing else, to be able to detect when they're being used on you. But even if you think this is all, all a lot of BS and you'll be caught you know, dead before you, you, before you try any of it, it's a lot, a lot of hooey, uh, not worth the time, let me leave you with one final principle. And this principle you must never, ever, ever violate. You owe it to your team, you owe it to your other stakeholders, and you owe it to yourself and that's this. So with that in mind, let me throw it open. I don't know how, if we have any time for questions or not, but we're going into a coffee break if anybody wants to hang around and ask questions. <laughs> this, you laugh. This is, this is my agent, Janine Adams. Those of, you that have, those of you that have read the Boyd book, she was the, um, she's the ex of Robert Corum. This could explain a lot. And uh, I'm... I pull this still out of a video that I shot of her where she's improving her closing skills. Yeah, Janine has very good closing skills, by the way. But I have to be honest with you. She can be a little impatient. Well, have a, have, have a great rest of the conference, and I'll, uh, I'll see you around the reservation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack.